but we're here to do other kinds of business tonight. It may have escaped your attention, Mr. Minister, but we had an election in America a couple of days ago. I noticed it. And it was a greater upheaval than I think even the Republicans anticipated. They thought they were going to do well, but one of my friends in the United States Senate, who is a Republican and has a leadership position, I saw him a week before the election, and I said, where do you think you'll end up? And he said, well, if we can get it to 5248, I'll really be happy. It's much bigger than that. This is a convulsive election for us. I personally believe it's probably not ideological. I think it's a wave election in which people, I was telling the ambassador earlier, there's a famous phrase the river guide uses in Montana when he has difficult clients. He says, they're half cocked in the ticked off position. He doesn't say ticked off, he uses another expression, but for the purpose of this, that's where our country is at the moment. They're ticked off. Mm -hmm. And if these guys don't get it done in the next two years, there'll be another wave election of some kind. The real question is, the United States, the great engine for the Western economy, what's going to be the impact if you can describe it now or if you can foretell what it may be on the Canadian economy? They're already talking about doing more with energy, for example, lowering corporate taxes, so there'll probably be less inversion coming up. If you can, and this is a delicate time, I recognize that, how do you assess this election results and the impact it will have on the Canadian economy? Well, I think the first point is to put uh, the, uh, the relationship in some perspective and then comment on how it, it, it might be affected. I mean, you, you talked about uh, the importance of the, uh, of the bilateral commercial relationship, which is uh, the largest by far in the entire world, uh, some uh, $2 billion a, a day in trade. Uh, you know, we, we sell uh, more in one year uh, to the United States, $332 billion, uh, than we sell to the rest of the world in three years. Uh, we buy uh, more from the United States uh, than uh, you sell uh, to Japan, China, and the UK. So this is a very important uh, relationship, and it will continue uh, to be important. Uh, Obviously, we don't um, get involved in, in commenting on, uh, on U.S. Uh, politics or, or U.S. elections. We work with, uh, with the administration and with, uh, with the Congress uh, to advance our interests and to, to enhance and enrich the relationship, which is diplomatic, uh, cultural, people-to-people, -people, and, and, of course, uh, commercial. Uh, so, um, you know, I... I um, I don't uh, look uh, at, the, at the election as necessarily, well, definitely not f changing anything fundamental. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about uh, uh, what might happen in respect to certain uh, particular files, and uh, one of those files obviously relates to the, uh, to the energy uh, sector. Um, I think the, the important, uh, maybe I should just put this in, um, in a perspective from, from the Canadian context. Uh, you know, we're, we're blessed with enormous natural resources. Uh, we have, uh, we're number one in, in potash, number two in uranium production, number three in, in oil and, and gas. But on the energy side, uh, we have a strategic challenge, uh, which is uh, that we only have one customer. And that customer, the United States, has found vast amounts of shale gas and, and oil. And that, uh, those discoveries, uh, which will be of enormous benefit to the United States, is changing the global energy picture. Um, so we have to look at that and uh, clearly have to diversify our markets. We have to find new markets, and they're out there, uh, and we're, we're going to be pursuing that. But in the meantime, of course, uh, the, the U.S. relationship is, is a critical one. And the United States, while it's found vast amounts of resources, will... Uh, over the next 20 or, or so years still have to import a fairly substantial amount of oil. The estimates differ, but perhaps 7 million barrels a day. So uh, let me just put that in the context of, uh, of Keystone because that's the, the subject that a lot I knew of people want to talk about. <laughs> I thought or I would answer I it would, before, yeah. before you asked it. Um, you know, we, uh, we believe that the Keystone pipeline will be enormously beneficial to both our countries. According to the U.S. State Department, it will create more than 40,000 
construction jobs and other jobs over the long term. It'll add billions of dollars in, uh, in economic activity, um, and it will produce hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue to governments to support critical social programs. As well, it will enhance national security, because after all, uh, if Canadian oil displaces uh, Venezuelan oil, uh, you're uh, going to be getting your oil from a reliable friend um, and partner who honors its contractual obligations and does not, five times in a row, threaten to cut you off. So we remain um, committed to the project and we believe at the end of the day it will achieve, uh, it will achieve approval. We're hopeful uh, that that will happen. As I need not remind you, there's a whole other argument on the other side. First of all, the United States is moving swiftly to energy independence with fracking and the other sources of energy that they're developing. The question is, do we need the Keystone Pipeline and the kind of oil that comes through it, which is unsettling a lot of people in the climate change community, including scientists? And could that have an impact on the relationship that is always so harmonious if it goes through and there's a huge body of people in America who say it's not our best interest, not just the people along the aquifer, but the people who are really concerned about the impact of those kinds of oil, uh, the sand oils that are going to come out of there that are contribute to global warming. Well, let, let me address that as, as briefly as I can. The first point is that the U.S. State Department conducted uh, uh, many uh, environmental reviews. I think it was the most uh, studied uh, project, uh, energy project, perhaps in the entire world. And it concluded uh, that uh, it, this project would not have a significant environmental impact. In fact, greenhouse gas emissions would be lower than the alternative, which is that we would export the oil to another country like China, or we would export the oil to the United States by, uh, by train. Uh, now, just to, to deal with the environmental uh, issue, the oil sands in total represent one one thousandth of global emissions. Emissions from coal-fired electricity in the United States are 33 times as much. So I think the, the focus of, of some of these environmental groups is misplaced. Uh, the, the, the issue of global warming is a serious one, but uh, the way to, to address it is to go after the big emitters and do it on a global basis. And so we're part of that, we're part of the, the solution, uh, but we don't see uh, this particular project uh, which would have a minuscule impact and according to your own State Department um, would not have a negative impact. I don't think this is really uh, part of that, uh, that discussion. Nevertheless, it has been identified by people who are opposed to the development of hydrocarbons as a symbol. And as a symbol, it's become politicized and you know, it's part of, of a base, uh, which, is, uh, which has, um, I would say, uh, created uh, an influence uh, politically. Two quick questions and we'll move on. Do you believe that global warming is real? And if you don't sell it to the United States, who would be your other customers, China? Yes, I, I do believe it's real. The issue is how do we best address it? And uh, clearly one of the ways to address it is to focus on, on reducing the high emitting uh, sources of energy. Now, we're, uh, we're committed. Look, the United States has become the biggest producer of oil and gas in the entire world. And therefore, I don't think, if I may say, the U.S. is, should really, is really in a position to tell us not to to develop our own, our own resources. And um, I think the U.S. understands that uh, if there's a market out there and we don't have any market in the United States, then uh, it's understandable that we would want to, uh, we would want to export our, our, our energy elsewhere. Over the next 35 years, over 90% of global growth will come from non-OECD countries. And of course, with growth comes the need uh, and demand for energy. So the Asia-Pacific area, China in particular, is obvious, India as well, uh, but, uh, but Japan and South Korea have, have tremendous energy needs, and there is a moral dimension. No country can emerge from poverty without 
adequate, affordable energy, and there is at least a billion people in the world without access to electricity, and another billion and a quarter with only insecure access. So I think we both, both our countries, can contribute uh, to supplying energy to an energy-hungry world. We were all very um, touched and unsettled by the tragic shooting in Ottawa recently. ISIS is now mentioning Canada by name. Mm -hmm. You're one of the Western targets that they have in mind. Has that had any kind of an impact on the general economy or on businesses here and their concern about whether Canada is a target and the impact that it might have on going forward with their businesses? I don't uh, see an immediate uh, economic impact, but this was um, a um, you know, tragic story that, that cost the life of a, an unarmed soldier who was guarding the tomb of the unknown um, the soldier and where, where we lay poppies in, in remembrance of, of our fallen. Um, and then uh, uh, the terrorists moved to Parliament building to, to uh, our institution of government uh, with mayhem in mind and, and probably an intent to, to murder uh, Canada's elected representatives. So this was a, uh, um, th this was a, uh, a terrible event, uh, but uh, let no one uh, misunderstand our resolve uh, to deal with this issue. Um, we will protect our citizenry and we will co cooperate as an ally with the United States and others in dealing uh, with, with ISIS uh, where it has to happen. It is a very difficult problem. I've been out there a lot and I've talked to the jihadists and the others. And a lot of the problem, it seems to me, is that we have two cultures crossing in the night without understanding each other and what we're about. And we need to get a lot better at that as well. But the line has to be drawn very firmly. And we need a lot more help than what we're getting from our Middle Eastern allies at the moment. That's just my editorial comment for the evening. But well, can, can, I, can I respond <laughs> in, in, in this way? Um, I, I think it's, it's almost always important to have a dialogue and certainly always important to understand where someone's coming from. But there is a point at which dialogue is no longer possible. Right. We saw that uh, with, with, with the Nazi threat and what we're dealing with with, with ISIL by all accounts is, is a medieval barbarism um, that is expressing itself in, in the torture of children, the, the sexual enslavement of, of women, uh, of, of girls, and the murder of men and women. Uh, I don't see uh, where dialogue comes into that. No, and, and it's, that's why I think the line has to be drawn and it has to be much stronger than it has been and it has to be more urgent than it has been. Moving on. We have about the same unemployment rate. It's now at about 5.9% in your country using the methodology. Right. United States is that. Our middle class is very unhappy, and that drove a lot of the election results. Your middle class seems to be very content, called the richest middle class in the world. What's the differential? Well, actually, our middle class isn't as content as they should be as the wealthiest, <laughs> as the wealthiest <laughs> middle class in the world. But I keep telling them that they're the wealthiest middle class in the world. Um, but um, uh, that's, that's our issue. Uh, the, the, uh, so the question is, is why? Now, you know, we have a number of important advantages. Look, we emerged, uh, you know, from this, well, the, the uh, international financial crisis and the Great Recession was the greatest recession since the Great Depression. It hit Canada. Uh, a little later than other countries. It affected us deeply, less deeply. We emerged from it a little more quickly and in relatively better shape. Part of the reason, perhaps, was were our natural resources. Another part of the reason was our solid banking system. No bank had to be bailed out. For the seventh year in a row, uh, the World Economic Forum has said that uh, Canada's banking system is the soundest uh, in the world. We've cut taxes by 180 times. The individual tax rates are now what they were 50 years ago. Um, we've got a AAA rating uh, um, with, a, uh, with a stable outlook, the top rating in the world, the largest country to have that rating. We have lower, uh, lower corporate taxes. Apparently, according to KPMG, they're 46% lower uh, than the United States. We're not a tax haven. 
but we've brought our taxes down to attract and retain capital. So a lot, is, a lot of things are, are, are going well, but uh, we, we still need to do better. We've got to get some of the cash in, um, in, in, in corporate hands unlocked. Uh, it requires more confidence. We, we, we're, we're pleased to see the American economy starting to move. It looks very sustainable. I can't comment on why your middle class is, is, is uh, less uh, content, but I, I do think that um, our economy is doing you know, uh, quite well, and um, we're going to continue um, next year when we achieve a budgetary surplus uh, to provide uh, further breaks for hardworking Canadian families. That 5.9% includes... That 5.9% is not an example of a throbbing economy because there are a lot of workers in that number who have much lesser jobs than they had before. And that, you know, we were the hope of the world in the 50s and 60s and 70s when people could get a good pair of hands and a strong pair of work boots, a job on the line and be paid well. Those days are gone for a lot of them. Um, but let me ask you about something that probably is more relevant as well. American corporate taxes are going to come down. That's going to happen in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. When that does happen, does Warren Buffett stay on his side of the border and not buy Tim Horton and other things on this side of the border? Well, you know, as I said, we've, we've positioned ourselves to have a competitive tax regime. And, you know, I, I can recall forever. Uh, our personal taxes were higher than the U.S., and our corporate taxes were higher as well. And with a smaller uh, economy, uh, that uh, created a disadvantage for, for our country. It was important to bring our tax rate down to perhaps a little bit less than the, than, than the U.S. Uh, we have enormous uh, capital needs. We've been able to attract capital. Uh, I mean, after all, uh, we're a stable democratic country. We honor our contractual obligations. Once. Uh, once uh, foreign investment is approved, we do not discriminate against foreign companies. So the, tax, the fiscal regime is an important part of that. If other countries move their taxes lower, well, uh, we'll have to uh, see what an appropriate response is. The uh, so-called millennial generation, which I've been paying a lot of attention to, not just because I have grandchildren who are about to come into it, but for other reasons as well, in America feel separated from our traditional institutions, beginning with the government, also large corporations. I think it's in part because many of them saw their parents lose their jobs or have to work two jobs during the Great Recession, lose their home, or get, uh, if not lose their homes, have to give up everything else that they had. Do you have that same kind of millennial distrust in this country about the economic institutions and governing institutions, and what does it say about the future? Well, I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's that acute because they, they're, we didn't go through the, the downturn um, in, in quite the same way. We didn't see housing prices decline by 30%. We didn't see hundreds of thousands of people lose, lose their homes. Um, and we didn't see the, the extent of the, the, the unemployment. So that is moderated, uh, I think. Nevertheless, we are, um, we are challenged by an unemployment rate amongst youth, which is higher, certainly, than we'd like, double the, uh, uh, approximately double the unemployment rate for the population overall. Um, on the other hand, there's some job shortages in, in certain sectors and certain regions. So it's critically important for us to match skills with jobs, uh, to provide more training, uh, to, to pay for apprenticeships, um, to do other things to, to uh, educate uh, our, our youth so that they can become employable in a way that, uh, in a meaningful way that will, uh, uh, will provide them the sort of uh, life that, uh, that they'd like to have and they've seen that their, their parents have. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's a challenge. There's a demographic issue and we're, we're very much focused on it. As you look at other models around the world, uh, Germany with its apprentice program, I know you've spent a fair amount of time in Israel. Israel has kind of an entrepreneurial uh, model that begins with everybody going in the IDF and learning teamwork and risk assessment and taking chances. And they come out of college, not at the age of 24, but like 35 in terms of their experience. What are the best lessons around the world for those of us in this part of the world in terms of training the new generation and closing that skill set? 
Well, it's, it's a question of skill set. It's a question of, of you know, providing innovation and the opportunity to, to increase a productivity which raises, which raises all boats. You know, we looked at the, um, uh, the, the issue of, um, of uh, science and technology and the amount that is invested by, uh, by the public sector and the private sector to see if there was an answer in that to improve, uh, to improve Canada's productivity. And, um, you know, the facts are that Canada um, the Canadian public sector invests more than most countries per capita, um, but the private sector quite a bit less. Uh, if you look at South Korea, they're number two on both the public and the private side. You mentioned Israel. It's, it's a bit of an outlier, and maybe the statistics aren't, aren't totally accurate, but you don't see them on the public side, and perhaps that's because some of the military expenditures aren't included. But on the private side, uh, they're by far number one per capita, and it seems to be working because they're the, 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 the country with the most um, companies listed on NASDAQ after the United States. But it's a different situation because, as you say, they go into the, the military, uh, conscription is, uh, you know, there is conscription, they identify the smartest people, they work together, and then they work, uh, they work outside together in the private sector. So that's got to be, that's got to be part of it. We have to continue to invest in science and technology. We've got to fund uh, the best of the best in university. Um, and in, uh, you know, in engineering schools, in, in science. Uh, we have to provide uh, the, the uh, entrepreneurs uh, with, the, uh, with the incentives and the access to capital. And there's a whole series of, of programs that we're working on um, for, to, to help incubators and uh, to, um, you know, to, to get that initial uh, start that is, is so crucial. I don't think there's a silver bullet. It requires a, a host of, of, of government programs. We're working at it, and we're looking around the world uh, to, uh, uh, to, you know, find the lessons uh, of successful uh, countries uh, to, to, make that, uh, to make that work. It's a continuing challenge. You're a lifelong resident of Canada, citizen, an important position in the cabinet. You have the added advantage of a Harvard degree from the business school at Harvard. We have a lot of talk in America about the American dream. What's the Canadian dream? And is it still as relevant as it was when you were a young man? Well, uh, that's an interesting question because we don't, we don't usually frame it uh, quite in those terms, but you know, the, the dream, the, the, the vision that we have uh, uh, for, for Canada is, is, a, is, a, is a Canada that is prosperous, secure, that, that supports people who need to be supported, provides the opportunity for everyone to succeed, to do their best, uh, to, uh, to find a, uh, a contented uh, life in, in a country that, uh, uh, that I consider uh, the greatest country in the world, and we want to make it even greater. Minister, thank you very much. It's been very enlightening. Thank you.